Okay, so the first parasite group that I'm going to talk about are the monogenians. Uh, these are common parasites of fish found in freshwater and marine environments uh, and estuary environments. Uh, so this is the first group of platyhelminthes parasites that we're going to talk about. And most parasites, uh, most of the time when people think about parasites, they're thinking of a parasite that's in the platyhelminthes phylum. So platyhelminthes phylum includes trematodes. This, this, this includes uh, Schistosoma mansoni which is a really uh, common trematode parasite for people in uh, Africa, for example, the monogenians, which we'll be talking about today, and cestodes, which are tapeworms. Uh, so the turbellarians are the basal group here, and they're mostly free-living, and the trematodes are then most closely related to the turbellarians, and the monogenians and the cestodes are more closely related to one another, uh, but we won't go too much into phylogeny. So I'm going to tell you first a little bit about turbellaria. So the turbellarians are interesting because they are the group from which the parasites arose. Uh, and there's a lot of free-living individuals, but there are some that are commensal and even a few that are parasitic. The ones that are parasitic tend to be parasitic on echinoderms, which are like sea stars and brittle stars and sea urchins and whatnot. Uh, and then others are commensals. So for example, the temnocephalida, this is an order of turbellarians, uh, are commensal on freshwater crustaceans. And being commensal is a reasonable first step towards getting to parasitism. So in order to be commensal, you need to, one, be able to find a host, which can be a difficult task when you're a really small organism in a really big environment trying to look for a host. And you need to be able to get into your host or hold on to your host, which can also be a difficult task in aquatic environments when your host could potentially move quickly and knock you off, or a current could come by and knock you off. So uh, in the Temnocephalida, you see that there's uh, the beginning of some different structures for holding on to things. So you see that there are tentacles uh, down at the bottom of this organism, and those tentacles are used for holding on, and at the far other end uh, is an adhesive disc, and that adhesive disc is also used for holding on, and these organisms can move sort of leech-like across their host. Um, so yeah, so mostly these are free-living or commensals. There are some paras uh, parasites, but not a whole lot, uh, and they have a pretty simple biology. But they're interesting because they're a step towards a movement uh, to parasitism. So to talk about uh, our first parasitic group, the monogenians, uh, 3,000 species and counting. I've seen numbers of 5,000 species and counting uh, in other places. They have simple life cycles, which means that they usually only have one host in their life cycle, as opposed to moving to different species throughout the course of their life. Uh, they typically infect fish, but they also infect uh, some other vertebrates, including turtles. And there's even one that infects the eyes of hippos, which sounds uh, quite annoying if you're a hippo. Uh, uh, they have high host specificity and high site specificity. So what that means is, in general, monogenian parasites are infecting one host species. So uh, all fish are not the same to these parasites. There's a particular species of fish that they'd be interested in. And they uh, will live on a very particular spot part of the fish. So on some host species, uh, fish species, you can find one species of monogenian that's living at the base of the gills, for example, that's adapted to hold on to that part, and a completely different species at the tip of the gills that's adapted to holding on to that part, uh, and you'll never find them in different places. They're very specific to those different sites. Uh, they're ectoparasites, which means they're living on external surfaces of the host or surfaces that are open to the environment. So for example, uh, they'll be infecting the gills, which uh, you might not think of as an external surface of the fish, but it opens out to the external surface, and so it counts as an ectoparasite. Um, because they have such high host specificity, they end up being really adapted to holding on to that very particular part of the host. And their adaptation for holding on is a structure called a haptor. And the haptors are on the uh, posterior end, and they're really adapted for holding on to very specific areas. So on the far right, you see a haptor that's mostly suckers. In the center, you see a haptor that has a lot of little hooks on it. And on the right, you see a haptor that's sort of like a sucking clamp. Uh, and so depending on the structure that they hold, that the monogene will hold on to, uh, the haptor will be well adapted for holding on to that very particular structure. Um... And generally, if you're a taxonomist and you're trying to identify parasites, these haptors are one of the first characteristics that people will use to try to tell the difference between the different parasites. So a little bit about the life cycle of these guys. 
there are a couple different variations on life cycles in the monogenians, uh, but it's all it's all pretty simple. So the adult will be living on the host, and uh, in some cases, the adults will produce eggs. And the egg-producing species are called oviparous, ova for egg and paris for bearing, so egg bearing. Uh, and they'll produce eggs that will do one of two things. One, they can sink to the bottom of the water and lay, lay down there for a little while while they develop. And then when they hatch, they'll have a free-swimming larva called an oncomyricidium. And this free-swimming larva will go off and try to find a new host of its own. Uh, the eggs can also, instead of falling to the bottom of the water, get anchored to the fish uh, by these little strings. Uh, and then they'll hatch on the fish and the free-swimming larva will go and find its own host. Uh, the viviparous, or the live-bearing varieties, will give birth to uh, offspring that are essentially mini-adults, uh, and there's no external egg stage. Uh, so those are the different kinds of life cycles, and I'll tell you a little bit more about, uh, about that as the lecture goes on. But first I'm going to give you a cool example of hyperparasitism uh, involving monogenes. So hyperparasites are parasites of parasites. So uh, you can see that there's an arrow pointing to an Udinella adult, and there are actually a couple different adults uh, that are infecting this copepod. So the big, the big host that they're on here, that's not actually that big, this is a blown up image from a dissecting scope, uh, is a copepod. And on the right you can see its head, and on the left you can see its two egg sacs. Uh, and it's infested with at least three monogenes, and you and uh, you can see that this is one of the species that anchors their eggs to the host, and I've circled one of the eggs, uh, Udinella egg. Uh, and this copepod was found on a horn shark that was caught off of the coast of Santa Barbara, and it was the copepod was clinging to the host shark's gills. So the copepod is a parasite of the horn shark, and Udinella monogenes are parasites of the copepod. So these are hyperparasites. Uh, which reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. So naturalists observe a flea, has smaller fleas that on him prey, and these have smaller, f smaller still to bite him, and so proceed ad infinitum. So even if you're a parasite, you can't escape parasites.